Okay, so the first question was by David Bremner, and it was that. How do we deal with the fact that the web rendering libraries seem to be essentially sec security unsupportable without daily updates? Uh, it's not a question of daily updates. I mean, certainly if you're using some of the more messed up ones, like, you know, older versions of the WebKit library, for example, uh, are, you know, are unsupportable. Um, I think that there are two answers there. One of them is you do actually need to do periodic releases of the WebKit libraries. Yeah. Uh, the second part of that, is, you know, and, and, you know, not daily, but probably much more frequently than Emacs is used to. Uh, and yeah. the other part of that is almost certainly that, you know, you're in a better position when you're not using JavaScript than when you are. Uh, yeah. The JavaScript implementation tends to be the place where the worst security problems are. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are, for example, only rendering email and you have JavaScript off, you get a little bit more time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem. I'm not going to say it's not a problem. Another option there, of course, is that uh, there are web rendering libraries that are a little bit more robust. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a web rendering library uh, written in Rust uh, that was written by the Mozilla people, and I am trying to remember its name. It's experimental, yeah. uh, but it does work, uh, and it has far fewer problems. Uh, okay. Anyway, next question. Sure. So the next one is, what are your thoughts for future of Emacs users who are not programmers? Um, all right, let me turn that around a little bit. I think that it is certainly not a great thing to break the use of Emacs for non-programmers, but mostly non-programmers don't migrate to Emacs. Emacs is a system that is designed for people who want to, who, who hack on their own tools. Um, actually, let me take a step back. In the talk that I gave a few years ago, I noted the fact that machinists and programmers are both unique groups insofar as we build our own tools. Machinists routinely modify the, system, the equipment that they work on day to day. They take their machines, they use their machine tools, and they use their machine tools to modify their machine tools. Programmers modify the programs that they use to build other programs. Um, we don't want to make Emacs or some of these other environments unfriendly to programmers. There's no shortage of systems that are extremely friendly to, to non-programmers. You will find that Microsoft Office is out there and is geared towards people who are writing text, uh, who are not comfortable uh, with, uh, you know, with, with hacking on code. Personally, I think that Emacs is not particularly unfriendly to such people either. But mm. my, my biggest concern is let's not make the tools that we use day to day unfriendly to us. Uh, I want to make sure that the tools that I am working on and with uh, are friendly for me. And, and if they are not good for me, I will cease to use them. Uh, and, and if other people think that they're also good for them, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but the most important thing is that they be usable for me while I am programming, while I am working on, on documentation for my programs, while I am working on the email I am sending other people about the programs that I'm writing, etc. Right. Okay. Thanks. So the next question is from, uh, let's see, one of the Boston attendees, and it is that, why can't we just use dynamically loaded uh, libraries? Why a full rewrite? Uh, I, I don't understand the context. Um, so I believe that you'd suggested that Emacs be rewritten, and they're asking to address some of the some of your. Well, I'm, I'm not suggesting that Emacs be rewritten. I think that Emacs, over coming years, should be incrementally updated and and renovated and replaced, just as it has been for decades. Uh, the Emacs that we have today is not the Emacs that it, you could have downloaded in 1985, and is even less like the Emacs that you could have gotten in 1979. Emacs has always evolved and always changed with time. Um, maybe they're referring to using dynamic loading in place of modifying uh, in place of modifying ELISP uh, or, or some such. I don't really understand the context, but you really need an extension language that is present inside of Emacs. The way that Emacs tends to work 
is by being very deeply integrated with an ex extension language. If you want to figure out what it is that a particular keystroke did, you ask the help system to bring up documentation on that keystroke. It lets you click on the implementation right there. This isn't something that dynamic loading really is well integrated for. Uh, Emacs is written in its extension language. You want that to continue to be the case. Maybe I don't understand the question fully. Maybe the person who posed it can restate it as, as we go on with this. OK, sure. So another question is, uh, what pages these days are quite reactive, JS heavy, and you know there's a lot of like single page applications and so a lot of JavaScript but not a lot of HTML. So I guess this person is mostly curious about how will this work in terms of Emacs and its uh, rendering engine and such. I, I missed about half of that because of an audio dropout. Can you read it again? Oh yeah, sure. So the person asks, web pages these are, these days are quite reactive, JS heavy, and with uh, things like single page applications, there's not really a ton of HTML. How will this work in Emacs? There's not really a ton of HTML. Uh, OK. So if ultimately people want to use Emacs as a web browser, um, you will need to turn on all of the things in, in a library like WebKit or the one that whose name I'm spacing on that's written in Rust that's part of the experimental Mozilla browser. Servo? Uh, Servo, thank you. Yeah, Cheers. Servo. You'll need to turn on that entire thing and hand over control of that window to Servo or to WebKit to, to a much larger extent, turn on the JavaScript, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, if you're doing, and, and, but if you're doing day-to-day -day reading of most documentation web pages, if you're reading your email, etc., not all of that is necessary. So it's an early step. Yep. Uh, we don't need to integrate email that, uh, pardon me, Emacs that deeply into the web. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe in five or ten years, if it turns out that people really like using Emacs as their web browser, it will grow more and more of that stuff. If it does, I think that we're going to need to have a better implementation language, partially so that <coughs> so that bugs in uh, in 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 web browsing libraries don't kill us. And by don't kill us, yep. don't give us security issues. Yep. We're going to need to be able to isolate our windows. Uh, better from each other, that is to say, our Emacs windows and their memory consumption, etc. Part of yep. that comes to the concurrency model, etc. But I think that we can put something together relatively quickly early on that is good enough for doing things like browsing the Rust or the OCaml or the C documentation you might want to browse online, <clears throat> or the ELISP documentation you want to might want to browse online, and reading your email. And over time, we can make more and more, of, uh, we can import more and more web browser functionality into Emacs. I will say this, someday, I would really like to replace my web browser with Emacs because I yep. hate the UI on my web browser. Um, right. I want to be able to switch between tabs and, and iSearch and what have you all from the keyboard. But it doesn't have to happen all in one step. Okay. The big mistake people often make in development projects like this is to try to do everything in one step don't. Incremental improvements are a big win. Having a path that gets from here to there in small steps usually wins more than something that requires a gigantic project succeed before you get any benefit. Makes sense. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. So um, this person asks if you have any thoughts on what things could be changed about the default Emacs configuration to help onboard new users. Um, I don't think the default Emacs configuration is the problem as much as the fact that Emacs has a steep learning curve. Uh, when you were first confronted with Emacs, unlike when you're first confronted with the average GUI program that exists these days, you need to learn quite a bit before you can get anything useful done. And, you know, that's a bit of a problem, but it's, it's also something good. And, 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 and I don't mean that it's good that the learning curve is steep. It would be nice if it couldn't, if it wasn't. But I mean that it is that it is good that it provides an interface which, once you learn it, um, you can do an incredible amount from the keyboard really, really, really fast. Which is part of the reason that the learning curve is so steep. It's got pluses and minuses uh, that the learning curve is so steep. But yeah. I think that the people who really want a very shallow learning curve are going to use VS Code 
or uh, or or or, uh, or Notepad plus plus or whatever else, uh, right. they're not going to be attracted to Emacs. You have to sell Emacs to some extent to people, and people need a few weeks, honestly, to to get to the point where they're actually pretty productive in it. I don't see that changing very easily. Someone comes up with a magical way to do it that doesn't make Emacs less useful. I would be interested in seeing it. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but we'll see. Okay. Thanks. So next up, we have uh, Ross could replace C, but not Elisp, right? Don't we correct? Right, and don't the goal, we? The goal is not to, to replace Elisp with Rust. I, I I don't see that as a viable thing to do. You, you want an interpreted interactive language that that has quite a different design from Rust as the extension language for Emacs. But Rust probably makes a very good replacement for the implementation of. The extension language runtime. Right. Okay. Thanks. Let's see. I think there's a couple more here. Uh, okay. So question is, have you researched the license issues that come with Rust being dependent on LLVM, which is not copyleft last time I checked, which was some years ago. Maintain L LLVM is free software. It's not copyleft. It yeah. Has an, it has an Apache license, I believe it is, or maybe it's the BSD license. But I mean, but you know, it's free software. Uh, you are free to use it any way you wish. Uh, there is, you know, there there is no proprietary software inside of LLVM. I don't see any reasons why you can't use it. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, lots and lots of free software is being built on top of Rust these days. It seems like a fine platform to me. Okay. Cool. Yeah, because the person was trying to argue or make a point that, uh, in their opinion, maintaining the strong copyleft is more important than a strong concurrency model. Emacs can remain copylefted indefinitely. I see no reason that Emacs would not be copylefted. In fact, right. if you incrementally modify the Emacs source code, you have to maintain the copyleft because yep. Emacs is copylefted. But lots yep. of people compile Emacs these days using Clang, which is, you know, part of LLVM. The mere fact that the compiler is is you know is Apache licensed and not GPL'd doesn't affect whether Emacs is GPL. Right. Okay. So, a couple more questions. So, this person asks, what do you think of the Luatech project? They took an approach that was very different from LSP and such. The which project? Uh, Luatech. So, a rewrite, I think, I think a rewrite of the tech engine, like LaTeX. I don't really know much about Luatech. Okay. So, I, I, I don't think I can comment on it well. Okay, cool. Um, Question, what do you think about Emacs in the browser as a web ID or on mobile smartphones? Uh, Emacs in the browser, meaning implementations of Emacs that are rewritten to write in the, to run in the browser? Possibly, or that, that are compiled to some sort of JS that can run in, in a browser? In other words, like using MScript and to run Emacs in the browser. Right, I imagine. I, I, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I have seen that most browser-based apps uh, and, and things like electron-based apps mm -hmm. seem incredibly slow, incredibly resource-intensive. And, and of course, there's been this dogma for many decades now, oh, don't worry about using lots of resources. Another couple of iterations of Moore's Law and not care anymore. Except yeah. Moore's Law, well, Moore's Law has not quite stalled out, but certainly done our scaling hack. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't find ourselves with single-threaded processors that with single-processor threads that are a lot faster anymore. Um, one of the reasons I hate VS Code, one of the reasons I hate Slack, never mind that Slack is not free software, it yep. uses incredible amounts of resources just to be a somewhat better IRC. <laughs> Yeah, and that's because and that's because it's running in in inside of Electron, which is basically yep. desktop browser apps. Yep. Um, if people want to compile Emacs and Emscripten in order to like provide an online Emacs for people for some reason, I mean, if you can, I would like to be able to run native applic you know, Emacs as a native application because it's much, much lighter weight. As for mobile, um, I would really love to have an Emacs that's tailored to run on tablets at some point because lots of people carry around tablets with keyboards these days. And when you're taking notes in a meeting, don't you want Emacs? I certainly want Emacs. Apple doesn't necessarily make that easy these days, but certainly there's no reason not to make that sort of thing available on Android or on various other, you know, free Libre uh, tablet operating systems. And maybe one can even sneak such a thing past Apple at some point. 
Right. Um, okay. And we have two two nice questions. One of them is, um, so you suggested Rust as a counterpart to C. Do you have any suggestions, a specific suggestion for the ELISP counterpart? Well, so here's the thing. Um, I'm going to I'm going to argue something somewhat controversial here, which is that I think that one really needs to tailor the language. You need to tailor the language for two reasons. The first of them is you need something that has a low impedance mismatch with the US because you cannot rewrite that vast amount of existing software that's in the list. Yeah. Or at least you're not going to rewrite it for 25 years. It will take decades yeah. if, you switch, if you switch extension languages before all of the old software that you want to run is gone. And, and, and this is not, and, and take a look at what, for example, what Apple has done with Swift. So Apple did not take a random programming language as their replacement for Objective-C. They created a tailored programming language that has easy interoperability with Objective-C, has Objective-C-like calling conventions, has yep. an Objective-C-like interface. And by doing that, they actually made it possible to migrate from one, from one programming language to another. I think that whatever comes next, I mean, it might be possible to make it Scheme or, or, or Common Lisp, I think that both of those are bad choices because I don't think either of them is actually as good as one wants. Uh, Common Lisp is getting a little bit crufty at this point. Common Lisp does not have the best module system. Common Lisp is not, and and you know, and it's got it's got other issues. Um, Scheme is certainly a nice small jewel-like language. Uh, it does not really, as 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 it comes out of the box, support programming in the large, etc. Also, whatever you're going to do, and, and I know people have tried making Guile do this, etc., you're going to want to run on the existing runtime because you're going to want a brutally faithful a ELISP interpreter to be running indefinitely, which really means you want the existing ELISP interpreter, which means you right. want to run on the same runtime, you want to have a second programming language running on the same runtime with a very close impedance mismatch versus ELISP, very similar models to ELISP, I think we're going to have to create our own. Okay. Um, that will probably be a bit controversial. A lot of people will say, well, aren't we missing the opportunity to use a language that everyone else uses? You know, in which case, you know, one would argue, why not use Python or Ruby or something? Except you're going to have to rewrite it in order to fit on top of our runtime anyway, and on and on. Um, I think we're going to need to write our own. So I'm not suggesting a specific one because I don't think the specific one exists yet. Okay, thanks. And two last questions. One of them is, you've mentioned uh, Rust a lot. Are you aware of the Remax project? And can you comment? Um, sorry, this is still the, the, the same. Yeah, go ahead. So the Remax project seems kind of interesting. I think they have done some very cool things in terms of using the Rust macro system to make it very, very easy to, di to build the boilerplate uh -huh. for uh, for ELISP primitives. Anyone who hasn't looked at it, it's kind of beautiful. You compare the Rust implementation that the Remax people have of ELISP primitives to the C implementation of the same primitives, there's no contest. The Rust stuff is beautiful by comparison because they use the macro environment in order to deal with all of the boilerplate. It's very, very lovely. And, and maybe the Remax project is a good model. Maybe it would be good to invite some of those people into the main Remax project. But I'm going to be blunt about something, which is that you're, if you don't have an existing user base that is, that is using your software, that is beating on it, that is bought into it, um, you're not going to be able to sustain the hacker community necessary to keep a large editor project afloat. So I think that insofar as the Remax project has been run as a fork of Emacs and not within the GNU Emacs project, yeah. I think that it is unlikely to actually reach a terminal phase where it is complete and where everyone is using it instead of the existing Emacs, uh, instead of the current Emacs source code. Um, okay. That said, if there was a good consensus, then Rust was the right language to use next. 
I think it would be a good idea to invite those people to move a bunch of their work inside of the existing GNU Emacs community, to merge the projects, and to use a lot of the stuff that they have developed to do Remax as part of GNU Emacs. Awesome. And our last question, after TextMate, Sublime Atom, and now VS Code, and several others, do you see any long-term uh, 20, 30-plus com uh, competitor to Emacs except VI? I don't know. I mean, the thing is that a large fraction of the, of the newer open source Libre editors that have, that have arisen recently are very, very tied to technologies that I don't think are going to be doing. Um, the, a lot of the web technology stuff, I mean, you think of it as durable, but you know, <laughs> a, a, attempt, to, attempt to view a current web page in a 10-year-old browser yeah. or a 10-year-old web page in a current browser and, and you're in a for a world of hurt. Yeah. Um, I think that if those guys manage to keep their... St the thing that's interesting about Emacs is that Emacs has been a system where if you put a bunch of effort in, and in my case, 36 years ago, in into learning the key bindings, learning how to, to navigate around, learning how to work inside it, um, that investment is still paying off today. Will will the people who are building VS Code still care about VS Code in a decade, let alone in another 40 years? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Uh, the one good th thing I've got to say about VS Code is VS Code is real free Libre software, okay? Yeah. Um, so in theory, if a community gets sufficiently interested in it, they can sustain it forever. In practice, it is so tied to current web technologies, I don't know if it's actually going to survive for 30 years without be having to, a painful rewrite five or 10 years from now. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, but I, I mean, I wouldn't discount it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the reasons I think that the Emacs community has to step up to the plate, because there are real competitors now. And for the first time, I think it has gotten to the point where if you are 20 or 22 years old, um, Emacs is not the cool thing necessarily to be used to. Right. Okay. okay. Awesome. That's it. Thanks again for your great talk and for taking questions here. Uh, and, and, and thank you guys for, for giving me the opportunity. It's, it's been great fun. Sorry about the, Cheers. About the technical difficulties. Uh, no worries. That's always always happens. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have a good... Uh, thank you so much for having me. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye-bye.